Uh, I'm delighted to be here and uh, you've all had a very long day. Um, so I'm in some ways feel I should apologize for raising such a deep question to which I don't have any final answers, but nevertheless, uh, I want to provoke us a little bit. Um, we've heard a lot about digital disruption in the course of today and about the many positive benefits there are for citizens uh, as a result of innovation in the digital media field and innovation plays a huge role in that. What I want to draw attention to particularly is um, a question that has always intrigued me and that is why is it that so frequently we, and I'm, when I say we, I mean policymakers or those who are resisting some of the more uh, negative features of innovation in this area, we always react, we're always on the back foot so to speak. It's very, very difficult to think about the present and the future in a way that leads to uh, proactive responses, especially in the policy world. So that is something that I want to think about in this talk today. And to do that, um, what I want to do is give a tiny bit of context and then uh, talk about theories in a nutshell. So this is not going to be a big, heavy um, theoretical exposition, but I want to signpost some theoretical traditions that I'm familiar with, that I've worked with, and which I am increasingly engaging with. Then to talk about um, some of the persistently dominant policy approaches that characterize the ways in which we, in many cases, react to digital innovation and then to think about how this infuses or gives rise to persistent inequalities. And by inequality, I will talk uh, particularly about um, inequalities in connectivity and in skills, but I also mean inequalities in terms of gender, in terms of racial um, access and participation in a mediated environment, as well as um, those other groups of people who are excluded. And finally, I'll talk a little bit about um, reflections on advancing the way in which we contribute to critical assessments of the developments in this area. So first, just a little bit of context or history. Um, disruptive technologies and power the, and their confluence is nothing new. I was always struck when I was, um, I think I was actually an undergraduate study, no, a master's student studying at the LSE at the time in the mid-1970s, when one of the key phrases that was being thrown about was that questions of who controls technology are central to who controls development. So if you read development as the evolution of culture, the evolution of the social world, the evolution of the political world and democracy, um, the, the whole idea that we should be very concerned about innovation around technologies is nothing new. And then I've put there a quote from Castells, who you all know um, is has been writing for years about the role of power in the development and innovation around digital technologies, the media, and uh, the communicative environment. And again, centrally emphasizing the key role of power relationships. Power relationships can be enabling, they can also be dis disabling. And then, it um, seems to me we've already seen this slide once today. <laughs> I thought I would just say, who are the uh, large players? Um, who we are persistently having our attention drawn to. We've heard equally today about a whole variety of entrepreneurial startups, of, about individuals who are creating, creatively making use of the tools available to us, and persistently also about the fact that disruption creates opportunity, but it also creates issues and problems and exclusions and inequalities. Um, so, let me turn to theory in a nutshell. Uh, I began my career, believe it or not, as a psychologist. <laughs> I morphed into somebody who some people like to call a political economist. Uh, one of my supervisors was the da Canadian Dallas Smythe. Um, and then the end of the 80s, I moved to Sussex University where the science policy research unit uh, was working. And there, the field of science, technology, and innovation was the dominant field. It grew out of a critique of neoclassical economics, but it was very concerned with disruptive technologies. And it was very concerned about this question of whether or not one should intervene 
if one foresees problems arising in terms of inequalities or exclusions, or whether one should wait and react when the evidence base became strong enough to demonstrate that there were harms, threats, or exclusions when something should be done. And there, I'm not going to go into what we have heard a great deal about already today, about incremental or radical innovations um, and how one categorizes those. But what I want to emphasize is the very strong message that came out of decades of research in the science, technology, and innovation literature. And that was that adjustments are always necessary not just because the speed or pace of digital innovation today is much faster, but it's always been the case, that adjustments are always necessary in the employment area, in the skills area, in the literacies area. Why are they needed? Because dynam market dynamics are always unlikely to produce equitable and often sustainable outcomes. This is not something that is special to the media environment. This is something which is always true. And Freeman, uh, Chris Freeman, who was the founder of Sprue and Luke Sutta, um, depicted digital technologies in the middle of the 1990s as the greatest juggler not, uh, that ever rolled. And so what I'm signaling here is that here we are today, in 2017, talking about these technologies as if they are a great problem. They have always been a great problem. Policies to adjust to structural rigidities in the economy are needed in order to ensure a better distribution of what? The economic gains from digital technological innovation. That was the STI framework, Science, Technology, Innovation Framework. And here was me coming along at that time to the same institution, say, ah, but what about culture? What about the social aspects? What about the political aspects? Can we not build them into a framework, which is also about STI. At the same time, and in parallel, in the 1980s, even before, 1970s, 80s, and 90s, there was a very strong, strong tradition, particularly in continental Europe, which was about, in quotes, the social shaping of technology, and where many of the design-oriented kinds of um, uh, perspectives came from, which were very interested in whether or not as they called them then, users could be involved in actually shaping technologies. Um, in the, what came to be known as the Scots tradition or the social construction of technology systems, um, what was the, one of the biggest contributions that they made to thinking about the issues we confront? One of them was that we need to co concentrate on the non-technical aspects and we keep saying this and saying this and saying this and we've heard this today. We need to concentrate on individuals or collectivities groups. We need to understand the relevant social groups and what their incentives are, whether they be social or economic or political. And that we need to understand that all of these technologies, both historically and now, are subject to interpretive flexibility at all levels. Not just interpretive flexibility as you and me as users of iPads or of augmented reality, but of the designers themselves or the captains of industry. All of them are engaged in some kind of interpretive flexibility around the dynamics of these technologies. Thomas Hughes was um, one of the people in this tradition who looked at the larger technological systems. There were many others, like John Law, V.B. Biker, who looked at more at the individual or micro level. But basically, in a recent summary of that body of work, concluded that we have understood for centuries that technology is an instrument of power. Hiding political agendas and power relationships and technological artifacts, practices, or systems is nothing new. Therefore, we should expect to see that in today's contemporary environment of mediated communication, this should be an ongoing development. By the time uh, I'd been at SPRU for some time and I'd been influenced again by my background in psychology and by this STI tradition as well as the Scots tradition, Roger Silverstone and I decided to try to bring together these different traditions in what I would describe then as an early hybrid. This is mid-1990s. And what we said was that the dialectic at work in the construction of the socio-technological envir technological environment is infused with actual or potential conflicts between what is technologically feasible and individual and collectively expressed preferences. <laughs> 
what we also said was that it's critically important to examine the pathway or directionality of digital technology innovation and focus on the dialectics of that process. Why focus on pa a pathway or indeed, as I'll come to in a minute, multiple pathways? Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons is that we struggle so much, again, with this assumption, which is a very much a top-down assumption and comes from historical linear thinking that there is one pathway. And that if somebody's come up with a technological innovation called virtual reality or augmented reality or a new um, app, uh, that it must be the case that put enough money behind it, it will be good for most people. That exclusion and inequality will not be a, a, a predominant problem as a result of introducing that. And if you think about contemporary studies today, where this kind of thinking is most prevalent, I would say, is in what is coming to be called infrastructural studies. Infrastructural studies tries to link the micro, the everyday life experiences, the experiential side of mediation, with the macro or structural side, which is more attuned to what people like to call institutions and some people like to call structures. And that, that tradition is bringing these disparate communities of scholars together. And they're doing so through a study of the materiality of technology not just the symbolic aspects, but the material as well. They are looking at pipes, yes. Fiber optics. They are looking at software, yes. In terms of design and innovation. But they are also looking at the materiality of the encoding of different values into laws, into legislation, into the practices of school children, as well as adults. And so this seems to me to be a very rich tradition it sometimes pops up in the more old-fashioned political economy tradition, which is why I quote uh, McChesney, um, who say in one of their books, the violence of technology resides in the way it cuts the link between the person and sensory interaction in the world. So even they are beginning in a strong Marxist political economy structuralist account of digital innovation to think very much about the experiential side if you like, the psychology of it. So let me turn away then from the theorization of this kind of um, media innovation environment to talk about the way in which the original science technology innovation notion has been picked up by policymakers. So remember I said one of the dominant themes coming out of the STI tradition was that we need to adjust can't stop that juggernaut, juggernaut of technology. We must adjust to it. And so the adjust, dominant adjustment policies, particularly in Europe, are to do with connectivity and skills. And I picked this picture specifically because it is a very male-dominated kind of um, discourse, sad to say. I guess I could have find, found some pictures with a few women in them, but mainly it is a male-dominated discourse. And there are three pillars, if you like, in this kind of approach to the digital economy, if it's often called, I think it also applies to many aspects of the creative economy. And the one, one of the, those is to improve access. So we must have 4G and then we must have 5G. We must have rural uh, connectivity. <clears throat> we must have the right conditions for markets to flourish and the right conditions are often um, oriented towards the right conditions for the biggest players, not the right conditions for the smallest entrepreneurial players. And thirdly, um, we need to maximize the growth potential of the economy. That is supposed to be the driver which bootstraps everything else. We get growth right, and everything else is supposed to follow along. We have to wait for it. So the principal, acts, you, principal um, focus of this particular interpretation of science, technology, innovation um, theory focuses on access, and you will have all have seen these kinds of charts all over the place. And there's always somebody behind, and there's always somebody in the lead. And the main aim is for the laggards to catch up with the leaders, or indeed to leapfrog them. I'm not going to go through all of those charts. I just wanted to make the point. The second principal focus, and I don't mean to be critical of this particularly in the sense that I think it's a very necessary focus. I don't think that um, we should be throwing babies out with the bathwater. The second focus is very much on uh, digital lifestyle style skills, on literacies, 
um, in the workplace as well as in the home for children. And that tends to attract a, quite a lot of investment, a lot of concern about inequalities between people without skills and people with skills. And it often in today's um, era, again, I'm not going to go through the chart, leads to enormous concern about things like um, fake news and whether children and adults can discern the difference between um, something which is posted on a website, which is an ad, and something which is posted on a website, which is actually a contribution and observation by somebody about the state of the world, in this case, the state of running shoes. Um, but the results, this comes from the UK Ofcom survey. The notion that only six in 10 adults can tell the difference is quite problematic. It speaks to inequalities, it speaks to exclusions of various kinds, and it, it speaks to why it is that the mediated environment is becoming increasingly complex and why it is that the notion that we can intervene to do something becomes increasingly problematic. So basically, and I've written about uh, imaginaries quite a lot. Um, I'm not going to go into that today. But the dominant imaginary, if you allow me to call it, call it that, is one that effectively says that mediated communication gives rise to all sorts of benefits for tourism, for the health sector, for environmental monitoring, for pe making people safe. There's no doubt about that. But at the same time, we really have to live with the fact that persistent inequality in people's life chances is the way the world is. It's normal. We're always in catch-up mode. We don't have a choice about that because that's the way the economy works. We can adjust to it, but we can't actually do anything about making it better before the fact. And just to give an example of, about how accepted this normal normalcy is, there's an interesting paper about Europe, um, which is written by a couple of economists, who have calculated that based on the investment strategies for technology hubs, and they've done analysis of more than just technology hubs, all concerned with creative industries and development in those areas, it will take at least 60 years. That's at least one generation, if not two, before the lagging areas catch up with the leaders. And that's a static point of view. When we think about all of the innovations that are coming on stream, that 60 years might get longer, it might get a little bit shorter. But the notion is becoming a normalcy that there is always this degree of falling behind, being a laggard, and never really catching up with the <coughs> leaders. And that is what has basically become mainstream thinking if you think about the policy reaction to digital um, innovation. Coupled with that, and increasingly, the notion that there is a natural pathway, not one that is one that is reflecting particularly particular elite or designer values, but a natural pathway of technological innovation is central to systems thinking in this area. And you can find it in the popular literature. This happens to be taken from Wired. And I won't read it all out to you, but effectively it is. Again, and this was in the last session, we heard a lot about the way the whole ethos is for technologies to recede into the background, that the goal is to make them as untransparent as possible so that they become enabling. The notion is that they will just seed in a very McLuhan-esque way into the everyday life of human beings. And if there are inequalities and disadvantage, catch up will fix the problem, but not for 60 years or longer. So this notion of natural innovation processes and pathways is also central to the whole history of thinking about artificial intelligence. I'm not going to give you a lecture on the history of artificial <laughs> intelligence. It would take too long. and You'd probably fall asleep. But people, if you look at the discourse around artificial intelligence from the 1950s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, 2000s, including Obama's task force that he ran in the United States with four workshops, multidisciplinary workshops on the future of artificial intelligence. I listened to all the podcasts. The same discourse is used 
some of the possibilities have changed, but the same discourse is used, the same worries about potential harms, potential threats, about technology out of control. In that sense, there is enormous continuity, and I ask you again, why are we still sitting here scratching our heads and saying, this is getting so complex, we can't really do anything about it. We can only react, we can only come in with policies uh, that will help. The notion that the calculated statistical quantifi qu quantifiable life is the optimal representation of human beings and their actions is not a new one, even though the literature is beginning to make us think so. It has been around for a very, very long time. I would argue that it is becoming more predominant. And the notion that it's the human being, you and me, who are quirky and unpredictable and need to have that unpredictability kind of smoothed out, and that that's a good thing, has been around for a very, very long time. And as machine learning and automation become ever more pervasive, again, this notion this imaginary of an optima, optimal quantifi, quantifiable self is not anything new to today's algorithms. It's been around as the goal for a very long time. And how does it work itself out when it comes to actual application? So if you take uh, the question of the way algorithms are being used in order to support upstarts and new competitors that then become quite big like Uber, um, the notion of the dominant imaginary is that this is good. Yes, it brings along a number of problems which have to do with adjustment to the fact that these companies introduce low wages, bad business practices, very poor social project protections. What do we do? We react after the fact. So that in the UK at the moment, London has uh, suspended the license of, of Uber. Why? Not because of anything specific about algorithms or innovative technologies in the media sense, or mediated communication sense, but because of a public outcry over the behavior <coughs> of some of the Uber drivers. And so the driver for adjustment and change is not within the media sphere, not within the area that we work, but outside it. Similarly, when it comes to digital, digital disruption and the whole surveillance priv privacy threats, and hidden choices agenda. What are some of the major drivers which are causing governments, the uh, European community's actions with regard to the uh, GDPR legislation? What are some of the major drivers of those adjustments to the problems of unequal uh, treatment of people and monitoring of groups in society? Is it a basic and fundamental concern really about the algorithms? Or is it much more motivated by the politics and the culture and the economics of companies who see their bottom lines affected negatively if it should turn out to be the case that their business models are not really sustainable, even though they are processing and doing data out, out, um, analytics on increasingly huge amounts of data. So again, the reason for adjustment tends to be something outside the focus of studies of mediated communication. And it's still informed by the bottom line of the businesses. So quite easily, one could go home at night and wring one's hand in, hands in despair and say, what is it that media studies, studies of media innovation can actually contribute. And I think there is something, and much more optimistic, that we can contribute. And one of the things we can do is to think about alternative digital futures. Um, something else that Roger Silverstone, who founded my department at the LSE, along with Sonia Livingstone, um, said some time ago, was mediated connection and interconnection define the dominant infrastructure of the conduct of social, political, and economic uh, life across the globe. This was a message which he cared about hugely, and it's one that I think all of you who've been attending this uh, symposium care about hugely. The question is, what is it possible 
to do about it, if it is so central, if it is the case that from a values point of view, from a normative or ethical point of view, people are not so keen to see artificial intelligence giving birth to itself over time, if that's the pathway we are on, but rather there needs to be some interventions before the fact to alter the pathway or the trajectory, as some might call it, um, of technological innovation. Um, interestingly, if it were only media and communication scholars who were thinking along those lines, and I think there are quite a few of them, I would be a bit pessimistic because we're just a small set, subset of the, of the academy and of uh, people who are influencing others outside the academy. But actually, the people who come from the STI tradition, science, technology, innovation tradition, themselves are beginning to question the logic of this process of adjusting after the fact to inequalities and to problems as they arise. And one of them is Luke Sutta, and he says, could it be that innovation is not always good for you? And we heard in an earlier session the expression destructive creation. It actually does come from Luke Sutta, and he worked very closely with, uh, works most closely with Mark Dodgson. Um, and he says, destructive creation may be the new norm. And if destructive creation is becoming the new norm, and that even the more hardline, top-down science, technology, innovation people are thinking that, as well as the more bottom-up designers, sociologists, psychologists are thinking that, then maybe the time is right to make an intervention <coughs> that might fundamentally shift this pathway that we happen to be on. Maybe the time is right to investigate how digital technology innovation pathways are related not only to finance and to employment, but to all of the other kinds of everyday cultural or experiential aspects of life. Whether it really is time to bring together an interdisciplinary micro and macro framework which allows us to ask those fundamental questions and not wait till the last bit of evidence is in so that we react after the fact, but to have fundamental questions about the shaping of um, the technological future. That goes beyond just investigating why the technologies are only available to the few at the expense of the many. So this goes fundamentally beyond access agendas and digital literacy agendas into the very ethos of the values which are embedded in a technological pathway which has become normalized and that everybody thinks is good for humanity. It seems to me this is meant to be a Tower of Babel. <laughs> One of the biggest problems, and we've heard this over and over again today, is scholars as well as people outside the academy talking past each other, speaking different languages in some sense, that this seems to be a problem, but I would argue that um, it's becoming less of a problem as people are fundamentally asking themselves the new normals are not necessarily consistent with either a catching up agenda or with a global sustainability agenda or with reducing inequalities. Something that must be done up front it just might be possible through a serious interdisciplinary engagement, particularly as I was um, implying across in the field of infrastructural studies, which really does bring together the macro and the micro, but also in other areas, to bring people together to fundamentally address the problem and to maybe, just maybe, mitigate some of the issues around non-transparent, increasingly difficult, don't, note I didn't say out of control, difficult to control technological systems around artificial intelligence, machine learning, neural networks, and those kinds of things. Um, what would this mean in terms of policy responses as currently understood by uh, most people sitting in Brussels, I suppose you could say? Um, well, one thing it would mean is moving away from media itself and thinking about the lives and livelihoods of the individuals whose lives are being mediated. So there are, as many of you will know, increasing discussions about whether or not income and wealth taxation be can be changed to address some kinds of inequality, moving away from uh, 
media-centric point of view. Lots of discussions are going on about wage subsidies and conditional or unconditional basic income guarantees. Um, there are experiments in s some Nordic countries. Uh, Switzerland voted this down, but it will come back again for those who lack skills because their jobs are disappearing. So there are moves afoot in that respect. These kinds of policies were uh, suggested by an economist, a critical economist, the late um, Atkinson. And he says um, in a book that came out last year, technological progress is not a force of nature, but reflects social and economic decisions. For us, this is not news. For him to say this, it's quite important because he's embracing the social as well as the economic. Um, but it's interesting to note that even he, when he thinks of these policy measures which are designed to address inequalities, thinks in terms, when he writes the rest of his book, of a natural progression of digital technologies from where we are here to the next stages of artificial intelligence. And he then raises a question about what happens to human flourishing, human beings, if we carry on down the pathway we are on. So just a few final reflections. If indeed you think there are some issues here, that you think that it is conceivable that we need more upfront or ex ante intervention, if you think that the captains of industry who are themselves asking questions about the sustainability of their business models, and they are, um, if that you think that they have a point, what role should ac critical academics play? And one role that they should play is to think about what it would take to shift this pathway away from its current direction. If you think that humans really should retain authority over their lives, then what kinds of changes should be put in place? What is it that human beings will do with their lives in the future? What kinds of activities will they engage in? What kinds of choices will be within their own ability to decide and basically be decided for them by augmented systems? And how and by or by whom or by what should citizens' life chances be established? Should we settle? for the normal story about lags, gaps, inequalities, and some winners? Or should, should we actually think of resistance strategies that go beyond just thinking about the internet, or beyond just thinking about a particular application, and join up these kinds of discussions with those that are being held by others who are talking about the economy, uh, politics, etc. I think we should do the latter. It's not an easy thing to do, but I think that it's something that we should be training all of our students to do. Um, and that's just what I think. So thank you. Thank you.